Friends, let us prepare to worship God. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Um, I, <laughs> it's, it's so lovely to be back here. I feel like uh, it, does, it feels like a homecoming, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hug you from here. Um, <laughs> I've missed you all a great deal, and um, and so appreciated the time away um, on sabbatical, uh, and looking forward to sharing with you uh, more about that experience. Uh, I, so I will tell you, the sermon is way longer today than I normally preach, um, and so this is what you get. Pastor goes away on sabbatical, and you come back with a lot more to say. Um, so there it is. Um, just a brief uh, note about in our order of worship, it, it calls on you to stand for the call to worship. You're, we'll just have you remain seated for that part. And then announcements. Uh, Dan's got his pub theology um, on Thursday night. If you haven't had a chance to, to jump in on that, it's a wonderful happening at 5050 Tap House at 7 o'clock on Thursday. And then next Sunday is Freedom Sunday, uh, where we're focusing um, on what Jesus calls us to do, to set the captives free. And this uh, is an extension of that um, community forum on modern slavery and human trafficking that we had about a year and a half ago. Um, and so the children um, on Sunday will be um, doing a fundraiser for IJM. Information about that is in the bulletin, but you will see their sweet faces out in the hallway um, next Sunday um, asking you to purchase um, footprints. Um, and that money all goes to the International Justice Mission. And then on Saturday, uh, we will have a screening of the movie Sold, 
um, and that'll take place in Fellowship Hall at 3 p.m. on Saturday, and we're going to have a representative from the Northern Virginia um, Human Tra Trafficking Initiative. She'll be here to speak a little bit about human trafficking and their work as well. Um, and so information about that is in the bulletin. Join us for that. We're looking forward to Freedom Sunday next Sunday. Any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Let us worship the eternal God. Let us worship Jesus Christ. Let us worship the Holy Spirit. To the one true God be praise in all times and places, through the grace of Jesus Christ, amen.
Together, let us offer our sin to God using the prayer of confession before us. Let us pray. We hear the call to trust in God always, but honestly, some days our stresses and doubts are even more real to us than God, and trust is elusive. We remember how Abram dared to believe in God's promises, but belief like that is hard to come by. We are often inclined to think, God helps those who help themselves instead of daring to rely on the word of our creator. When the world seems filled with dangers, we can be quick to protect ourselves and we forget the wisdom of scripture, which reminds us that we find traces of evil both outside and inside of ourselves. With God's help, we confront our fears and struggles, and we call upon a power greater than our own to resist their pull. Hear us, Holy One, as we confess our frailty and failings. Friends, hear the gospel. Though fear should beset us, though danger calls us to close up our doors, though troubles assail and lead us away from the ways of grace, only one thing is necessary. Just turn back to God's promise of grace. Remember that God is reaching out with loving arms and let yourself be held. Only ask for forgiveness, and it is ours. Know that in this moment we have asked, and in Christ Jesus we are forgiven. Please be seated. Any children who are fourth grade and younger, fourth grade and younger, are invited to come forward for the children's time with Todd.
can be trusted with small things can also be trusted with big things. And so I thought about what that might look like for a child and what situations they might face each day um, that might seem like little things, but really add up to be big things. Um, and so the first is I thought of a child who might see a person drop some money out of their pocket. And so it might be an easy thing to pick that up and to keep it, but you know that it's not yours. You know that the right thing to do would be give it, to give it back to the owner. Um, so God teaches us and shows us that we should be honest always. And so we would make that choice to give it back. Um, another choice that we might run into, we might be playing with a ball in our house. And maybe even if a parent has told us we shouldn't kick that ball um, around in our house, sometimes we might do it and it might break something. Um, and so what would we do? We could make up a story of how the thing got broken or we could tell the truth and say that we're sorry. God wants us to always be honest so we know that the best choice um, is the honest choice. Um, we might um, be told by a parent not to go into a certain room in our house. Um, and so we would maybe think we could sneak into that room and sneak out and no one would ever notice or ever be able to tell. Um, but we know that the best choice would be to listen to our mom and dad and um, those that God has put in, in charge of keeping us safe. Um, so we can do the, the right thing, the honest thing, by doing what God wants us to do. Um, so these things might seem like small things to some people, but they're big things to God. So as we are honest in every um, day situations, God will prepare us to be honest whenever there's something really serious that we need to be honest with, all right? So he'll, he'll give us the practice in the little things to be prepared for the big things. Um, so congregation and kids, if you would join me in a word of prayer, um, let's close out our time together. Dear God, Dear God you, want us to always be honest, you want us to always be honest, but sometimes it's hard. Help us choose to do what is right. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right, kids who want to go out to We Ones Worship, now is the time. As they're doing that, I'm going to invite you to stand and turn and greet your neighbors in the name of Christ.
Scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Hear now God's word to us. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that, when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of oil. And so he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. And then he asked another, how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the, the dishonest wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Monday was my, my first day back in the office after 13 weeks of sabbatical. And Dan McCoig um, is our, was leading our staff devotions and said, I'm going to read the text for this Sunday for the preachers. And he reads this parable, and this is my least favorite parable of all time. I, I wanted to slam my forehead onto the table. So I'm not alone in this feeling. Um, uh, public theologian Phyllis Tickle calls this the most difficult parable of them all. And David Lowe's, who's the president of Lutheran Theological Seminary and one of my um, favorite contemporary biblical commentators, calls this the most confusing parable. And he goes on to explain that if we feel confused by the reading of this parable, uh, we are not alone because it appears that Luke was really not sure what to do with this parable when he was placing it in to his, his faith statement about Jesus, his, faith, his, his telling of Jesus' life. And so really, what do we do with this parable? So I think the first thing that we do is that we begin with, with the location of the story um, in Luke's narrative, because I think that will give us um, some insight into its meaning. So if you've got um, your Bible open, um, you can follow along and see what I'm talking about. So, so we're going back to, to chapter 15, beginning of chapter 15, uh, where Jesus is doing things that, that anger and upset the religious elite, um, things that they, they considered unclean, things that were, were socially and religiously unacceptable, and namely that Jesus was eating with sinners and with tax collectors. And so the heart of their criticism is that Jesus welcomes these people and, and sits at a table with them and, and dips his fingers into the same olive oil with them and, and considers them worthy of having a relationship with. And while that didn't sit right with the religious leadership, Jesus then tells a couple of stories 
to explain why this behavior is completely in line with God's kingdom, with what God wants to see happen in the world. And so you're, you're probably familiar with these stories. Um, Jesus tells them about this, this terrible agribusiness, agribusiness decision to, to leave the rest of the flock unprotected and go off in search of one lost lamb. And then once the shepherd finds it, he throws this huge party to celebrate. And Jesus tells them about a woman who works so hard to find a single lost coin, and then when she finds it, she shares her joy with all her neighbors. And then Jesus tells one final story, a longer story, and it begins, there was a man who had two sons. And so we usually call this story the parable of the prodigal son, but the story is not really about this youngest son who leaves. The story from the beginning is about the father. There was a man who had two sons, not there was a man who had a father and a brother. There was a man who had two sons. And so a parable, a parable is different from a fable or a fairy tale because parables are meant to confront us. They're meant to disrupt what we believe rather than to confirm exactly what we believe. And so, if we read a parable and we feel, we feel disoriented by it, the parable has done its work. The parable of the son who leaves and the father who longs for him to return is truly a parable because, because we believe that the father is ridiculous for running out undignified to embrace his son before the son can even say, I'm sorry. And the father puts on him signs of honor, a, a ring and a cloak and sandals. And this is, we know, this is not what we would have done. We know this. The father's actions are disarming, but this is Jesus' way of telling us about who God is. And so immediately, immediately following the end of this parable, we find another parable, and it begins almost the exact same way, which I think is meant to be a sign for us of how we need to understand it. Jesus tells his disciples there was a rich man who had a manager. And so now quickly, I want to jump to the end of this parable and see where we are. And, it, and it's with Jesus um, talking to the Pharisees who we are told by Luke were lovers of money. And there's a parable that follows that talks about a poor man, Lazarus, Lazarus and a rich man, and the rich man is punished for the way that he uses his wealth, the unjust way he uses his wealth in his lifetime. And so the parable that we read this morning um, sits like a bridge between these two stories about how God's kingdom works and, and a story about the dangers of the love of money. And so what are we to do with the, with the story in the middle, the parable in the middle? Um, commentators are all over the map in their interpretation of this parable. Many of them say it's a parable about money. It tells us something about money. However, if it, if it is about money, it is very confusing. You should defraud your employer and you will be rewarded for it. You should win friends with money. You should be faithful with dishonest wealth. I don't even know what that means. You should be faithful with dishonest wealth. There are two different kinds of parables. There are kingdom parables, which tell us who God is and what God is like and what God is doing. And there are wisdom parables, which paint a picture for us of what our lives should look like. And so, I have this hunch that we, that we have issues with this parable because we want to read it like a wisdom parable, like, like it should tell us how to act, when really it is a kingdom parable that is telling us something about God. And so it begins, there was a rich man who had a manager. And so from the start, we know that the story is not really about the dishonest manager, but about his master. And so it is the master that we will want to watch closely as we read through this parable. So the wealthy master hears from a credible source that his manager is stealing from him, defrauding him. And I want us to, for a moment, 
um, to take up the Jesuit practice, I spent a lot of time with Jesuits this summer, the Jesuit practice of prayerfully and imaginatively stepping into the story, placing ourselves into the story and into the shoes of the dishonest manager. So he is, he's summoned to his boss and maybe he has no idea why, but this job is all that he has in the world and he is hoping that something good is coming his way, maybe a raise, maybe a promotion. And his boss says without warning, you are fired. Turn in your accounting books immediately. And words catch in the man's throat and his stomach feels sick and he feels like he can barely breathe. This is all I have my whole life. My whole life is in this job. And without it, I have nothing. And I am too old to go and do manual labor and I cannot bear to beg in the streets. And I can tell by the look on my boss's face that there is no hope of me talking him out of this. He has already judged me guilty. I need some allies quickly. And the only thing that I have leverage over are the debts that are owed to me and my master. And so um, I'll, I'll summon all these tradespeople and I'll reduce their bills. And he thinks to himself, if my boss has already decided that I'm a, ch a thief and a liar, this dishonesty, this additional dishonesty won't change a thing. And so the man, the man returns, still feeling a little sick, and he lays the counting books before his boss knowing full well that when you open to the last page of the ledger, he will see exactly what he did. And he is bracing himself. This rich man could have him thrown in jail or even worse. And the manager is just hoping to be dismissed quietly. And if you turn to the front page of your bulletins and see that beautiful drawing by Bernand, on the cover, you will see this moment. This is the moment waiting for a decision, waiting for a response. And here is where we keep our eyes on the rich man who could choose to be cruel, who could be self-righteous, who could be punishing but in the remarkable, unsettling, and unfair twist of the parable, the cheat, the liar, is loved and commended. And this is the moment when we see that the story was about God all along, and it turns out that God has little to do with what is fair and giving us what we deserve. God's kingdom is not about keeping proper ledgers and exact accounting so that everyone gets exactly what they deserve. It's about God forgiving our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do you see how that plays out in this parable? God forgiving our debts as we forgive our debtors. So reflecting this week on this parable, which I, which I hate, um, I, was, I was contemplating why, why personally I have such a struggle with it. Um, and this is, what I think, this is what I think is going on. Um, when I approach this parable, and, and oftentimes when I approach the Bible, I walk up to the Bible ego first. I want to know what the Bible wants me to do. I want to find myself in the story. Where are the answers to my questions? Oh, great book of answers. What does this, this poem or this letter or this story or this little bit of history, what does it have to do with me and my life, but I have it all, all backwards. The Bible, first and foremost, shows us what God is doing, reveals to us who God is by how God relates to us. Jesus is God's living letter to us, all about himself. And we will find ourselves in the story too, we will, but that is because 
first we belong to God. So approaching this, this parable, ego first, makes it very difficult to figure out what's it all about. This is how we should act. This is how Jesus wants us to act. To be dishonest and be rewarded for it. We, we should buy our friendships. That's how we should relate to people, through our money. What we see happen in the parable feels unfair. It's all wrong. I kind of want um, to say to Jesus, you got the punchline wrong. You told the end of the story wrong. The manager is a liar and a cheater and a betrayer, but then again, so are we, and so the parable is about us after all. While I was on sabbatical, I listened to this um, wonderful podcast called Invisibilia, which is all about the hidden, invisible forces that shape us and move us and affect our behavior. And one episode that, that has really stuck with me um, was on the psychological concept of non-complementary behavior. Non-complementary behavior. So this is what it's all about. What we all do for the most part um, is that we tend to match other people's behavior. So when someone insults us, we insult back. When our spouse is short with us or cold, we respond exactly in kind. When we think a friend is ignoring us, not responding to our texts, not returning our calls, we do the same. Every act of aggression is met with more aggression. Or contrary, when, when a customer service person on the phone is funny and friendly and apologizes genuinely for keeping us on hold, we tend to say, oh, that's okay. When someone smiles and waves at us from a passing car, we smile and wave back, even if we have no idea who they are. But to do the opposite of that, which is non-complementary behavior, to do the opposite of that is much, much harder. To be kind and calm and gracious when someone else is getting irate and getting louder and getting aggressive to be hurt physically or emotionally and not to do the same back, that is much, much harder. And so this podcast begins with a true story about a group of friends um, a couple summers ago celebrating. They're out and they're in their backyard in Washington, D.C. It's a beautiful summer evening. They have uh, good wine. They have good food. And the man who tells the story in the podcast says, all of a sudden, between him and his wife, the head of his wife, he sees this arm pass through, and at the end of the arm is a gun. And this man walks in the backyard and demands money from them, and the problem is that no one has their wallets, no one has any money. So they tell him this, and he becomes more irate, and they try um, to guilt him, and they try to convince him, and they try to plead with him, and nothing works, and he's getting angrier and angrier. And finally, one of the people sitting around the table says, look, we are, we're here with friends and we are celebrating. Why don't you come and join us for a glass of wine? And suddenly everything changes. Everything changes. So the man, the man tastes the wine and he sees that it's good. And so he, he grabs a glass and then he puts his gun away and he picks up a piece of cheese and he's with them for a little while and finally he says, I think I'm in the wrong place. And he asks for a hug, and then he leaves the backyard with his wine glass in his hand. We listen as Jesus tells his followers that if they are hit in the face, they should turn their heads and show their cheek to their attacker. This is so different from what we want to do. Not responding with violence or with hatred or revenge implies a profoundly different shape to our whole way of being. Jesus says to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. And as he rode into Jerusalem, the crowds waved their leaves and their branches at their hoped for conquering hero who would crush Israel's enemies with violence and with power, and they were sorely disappointed. And I have this, this idea that if, if Judas 
that Judas turns Jesus into the religious authorities not because he's greedy and he wants money, but maybe out of loyalty, he, he thinks that if, if armed guards come at Jesus and they, they draw blood, that finally Jesus will stand up and will fight back with violence. But this is not God's story. This is not God's story. The entire arc, the entire arc of God's story that we find in our Bible is is the ultimate act of non-complementary behavior. So when the people that God loved were the transgressors, when they were the ones who caused the pain and caused the separation, God chose love and vulnerability and self-sacrifice in Jesus Christ. And so on the cross we see Jesus, our example of non-complementary behavior, for, for he was wounded and chose not to wound back. And so he is our example of a, of a God-shaped life, of a God-filled life. So we sit, we sit across the table from God. And we know that we have told lies and we've, we've done all these uh, mental gymnastics to convince ourselves that we've done nothing wrong. And we know that we shared gossip when we promised secrecy And we know we have said things that we knew would hurt someone and we said them anyway. And we've taken and we've taken and we've taken and we've been stingy with love and with money and with grace. We've even cheated when we thought no one was watching. And so we sit across the table from God and expect punishment. But we find that God does not act at all the way that we expect. God does not act at all the way we expect. And this changes us, friends. This changes us. On the way in this morning, I, um, I heard this interview with Ruby Sales, who's a, a public theologian and a civil rights um, activist. Um, and she um, gives up on God early in her life and becomes a Marxist and a materialist. And she has this encounter with this this deeply hurt young woman, and she all of, a sudden, all of a sudden discovers that she needs to discover an inner life that changes the way that she interacts with the world, to develop an inner life that changes the way she sees and interacts with the world. And that's what God asks of us. That's what God wants for us, so that we react differently because we've been changed. We react differently. We, we take the grace that we have received that we didn't expect and we send it back out into the world that doesn't expect it either. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you taught us to pray not only for ourselves but for people everywhere. Hear us as we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, your unity, and your peace. The church here in Winchester, the church in Guatemala and Bangladesh and Ethiopia, Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead our nation and all nations in ways of justice and of goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, Uphold neighbors in need. Defend oppressed people. That this world may claim your rule and know true peace. Give grace to all who proclaim your gospel that through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy that by their teaching and example may reveal your love for all people. 
Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble or sorrow or poverty or sickness or grief. Especially those known to us. We lift before you Terry Hicks, who is recovering from surgery. For Nick, following his surgery. And the victims of the attack in New York City this morning. For the family of Don Unger, who passed away yesterday. For Cameron, asking for strength during recovery and the battle against addiction. For the family of Wayne Davis, who died unexpectedly. And Lord, use this time of silence and hear the prayers of our hearts. Prayers for our world. This community. A loved one. situation that we don't quite know what to make of. And Lord, we pray for healing. Healing in body, healing in mind, healing in circumstance. We pray above all else for the work of your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Be seated, please. With gladness, let us now present the offering of our life and our labor to God.
Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have gifts to share. Accept and use us and our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Go now in safety, for you cannot go where God is not. Go now in love, for love alone endures. Go now with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go now in peace, for it is the gift of God to those whose hearts and minds are in Christ Jesus. Amen.